Okay. Uh, part two of my talk, uh, you got an introduction in what the kind of work that I'm trying to do with the blink reflex. So I'm going to, uh, so the, part, the research here, actually I want to preface this by saying um, something about uh, how thankful we are that uh, BEBRF sponsored us for uh, this research. Um, research is a difficult work and our lab has been focused for a long time in Parkinson's disease and uh, I had been seeing patients with blepharospasm throughout my time uh, ever since I became a movement disorders doctor and had been following uh, the literature but had never done anything about um, seriously doing any research in blepharospasm. Uh, when I found out about the BEBRF, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how, it might have been at one of the academy meetings, um, it started to germinate the idea that, you know, we're always looking for uh, interesting uh, pilot funds for the kind of work to stretch out in new directions. So I would say it's a success because it's really gotten our lab's attention switched to blepharospasm and dystonia. And now I give talks on dystonia. We've dug into the literature on blink reflex and other reflexes um, as far as uh, treating dystonias and has generated a lot of ideas in uh, both my clinical practice and, and in research. Uh, the flip side of this is, uh, as in research, uh, this, is new, this is new and uh, trying to be logical about how we proceed, and it's difficult. And so we had a lot of uh, blind alleys along the way that you'll hear about. So not everything here has been published or looked at uh, fully. So I'm just going to give you a broad view of what we've done with two years of funding uh, from BEBRF, uh, which we are just really grateful for. And, and we're going to be continuing this work. So thank you. Um, so, uh, I have no, th this is my disclosure, and we're going to be talking about some off-label uses of uh, electrical and magnetic stimulators. Uh, this is uh, from this morning. I don't need to go over this again, right? You all know very well what the blink reflex is. The recap is, uh, the, the bottom line is, the blink reflex tends to be hyper excitable. We have two ways of measuring that. This blink reflex recovery is that uh, suppression when you do paired pulses. And there's this uh, exaggerated long-term potentiation, which is the observation made in 2001 that got me interested in all this. I'm going to skip those. You saw those this morning. So here's the question we asked when we started to get into research. We said, is there a way to reduce this excess excitability and blepharospasm? Uh, this is a brain disorder at its heart. And uh, here is a rough... Um, schematic of how the brain is organized. So here is your facial nerve. Um, there's a, the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve 7. That is the facial nerve coming out of the brain stem. And it covers the muscles on this side of the face. It also covers the other side of the face as well. That's the brain stem where we study the blink reflex, right there. Uh, in, a, in the back view, it's over here. The brain stem is connected to the rest of your brain. In this case, this is a um, view of the mouth on the side of the, the brain. The brain roughly has an organization along the motor cortex of various parts of the body. There's a hand area. There's roughly a face area. The eye area, the eye blink area, is a bit controversial about exactly where on the brain voluntary control of closure is. And we'll, we'll get into that. Uh, but in any case, the brain up here is probably where we generate what are called voluntary eye blinks and uh, allows us to say when you want to blink voluntarily, that's how you control the blink. That signal gets passed down through the thalamus, down to the brain stem, and then out to the, um, the facial nerve. So there's two simple ways to look at it. What I started with was if this, this long-term potentiation, this thing that caused LTP in the brain stem, uh, was something that was localized in the brain stem, then what we should be able to do something uh, to the blink reflex, to modulate the blink reflex and, and, and therefore accomplish two goals. Number one, give patients a uh, research clinical trial study that they could participate in. Uh, and number two, and more importantly, while you're doing that, to generate some data on what exactly it's doing to a, a circuit that I can measure so that we can extrapolate this to future studies in an objective way. Um, and this is one of the, the issues, is we don't have any proof of any of these things diagnosing or proving that you have, have blepharospasm. So it's important to try to generate the data, data along the way so that it can be replicated in the future. Um, this is a really nice uh, review of different ways that 
uh, plasticity can be modulated by a currently hot field of uh, neuromodulation. On the left side are basic science means of modulating synapses, like I showed you this morning. There's a high frequency stimulation paradigm where you just zap the first neuron very quickly at, say, 100 hertz. This is in a, you know, animal model in a slice of hippocampus, the memory circuit often studied in mice and rats. Um, it's just a, a couple neurons that you can isolate and you can test in great detail. We can't obviously do that in you. Um, but if you do this at high frequency, you tend to have an increase in excitability. That's LPP. If you do it at low frequency, say one hertz, then you tend to get a suppression in excitability. There's another pattern I'm not going to talk about called theta burst, which you can do it in certain patterned ways to get either LTP or LTD. And then there's a timed spike stimulation, which I showed you the schematic of this morning, if you remember, uh, where you have two uh, neurons converging in one spot, and you can either strengthen or weaken that synapse. These are on the basic science side. This is what I do in the Brain Mapping Center. Uh, we've tried all of these things and, and, and others. Uh, this is a, a magnetic stimulating coil that's put on the head. Uh, this is not the project that BRF originally um, uh, was funding us to do, but I'm bringing it up because there is some research um, with that. Uh, but you can non-invasively stimulate the brain through here, and you can, using certain measures, get increased excitability of the motor cortex of the brain itself, and you can lower excitability. You can do it with theta burst stimulation, you could do it with this spike timing thing, and you can do it with um, what's called the transcranial direct current stimulation, which is passing current directly through your um, brain with a, um, a device that regulates a nine volt battery. Um, You'll notice that these are all uh, sort of uh, brain and hand. That's not what I'm going to talk about right now, but I wanted to introduce these concepts to you. Uh, what we did in our um, uh, grant is ask the question, can we induce long-term depression? We want to calm down the blink reflex if we can. Uh, can we calm it down at the brainstem level? So you saw that picture. There's the brain level and there's the brainstem level. We're going to do, our lab was going to do the brainstem level. And we had three choices that we went through in trying to do this. And I, I do say trying. Uh, the first one was low frequency stimulation. I mentioned that in the earlier slides. The second was a spike timing burst, which was based on this, um, the, the Mao and Evinger in 2001 paper. And the third one is trigeminal nerve stimulation. This was uh, from our grant. This was our idea. We said, we're going to take a patient uh, with left wrist spasm and we're also going to take some uh, control subjects like spouses who do not have left wrist spasm. We're going to do some blink reflex testing on you um, before we do anything. And we're going to count your blink rate and, and do some clinical scales. Then we're going to give you low frequency trigeminal nerve stimulation for about 30 minutes. Just zap away one time per second. And you can probably get this already betrays a little bit of our um, naivete when we did this. But in any case, after you do this, then we're going to do our blink reflex uh, testing again at 20 minute intervals and see if we can get a lasting reduction of blink reflex. And this is probably overly optimistic and overly simple, but it certainly got us our start. And we spent a lot of time uh, learning a lot about the blink reflex, including things like when you get people in your lab. Uh, I don't have a picture of it. When you get people in your lab, um, they get a little anxious that you're taping electrodes to them and you're going to stimulate them at random intervals every 30 to 60 seconds so that you can't predict when they're going to come. And they kind of close their eyes in anticipation. They get very nervous. You tell them to relax. They fall asleep, amazingly enough. And these things, the more we talk to other labs around, you know, everyone publishes really nice papers on the blink reflex, but they all face the same issue. Uh, the, the blink reflex is not as clean as we would like it. And so we probably spent some months uh, working out a way. We, we actually ended up with uh, getting a dental chair donated to us so people could relax. We would play a movie in the far corner of the room so they could watch a movie and stay focused on the movie while keeping their eyes open and awake. And then they could ignore the fact that they were actually getting zapped. <laughs> it worked really well. Uh, uh, but it took a long time to get there. Um, now, here's the other thing. Um, this was uh, one of the papers that has, it's one of the, this series of papers demonstrated the fact that you could use the low frequency stimulation of trigeminal nerves 
to calm down the blink reflex. This comes from the headache literature and the pain literature. And that's important in a little bit. So what they did was something very similar to us. They do some baseline blink reflex testing. They do low frequency stimulation of either the right eye or the left eye, or they do no stimulation at their control, which is absolutely great. And then they do blink reflex testing afterwards at 5, 13, 20, at, at various intervals afterwards. And lo and behold, after you do this in their subjects, they had um, all of, I think, uh, six subjects or something, or eight subjects. Um, the blink reflex goes down in size. This top line here is the blink reflex size, and, it goes d and the top line is control. So no stimulation. So it should be the same, right? But it's not the same. It goes down. It goes down the time, and it stays a little stable and kind of dips down, OK? And that's probably habituation. And that's something that we didn't think enough about, but it's probably a lot of what we are seeing in our preliminary data. So they see it too, but what's remarkable about their study is that in all the ones where they had low frequency stimulation, they're modulating the blink reflex. You get a decrease, significant, even at 37 minutes, 40 minutes later, significant decrease compared to no stimulation at all. This is a lasting effect of doing this to your trigeminal nerve. Okay, now, these are normal subjects. They're not patients. They don't have blepharospasm, but look what they did to do this. They did a stimulation at 300% pain threshold. So this is very, very high intensity stimulation. In fact, they designed an electrode over the trigeminal nerve to, to specifically target small fibers uh, in the nerve, which are the painful, the pain-carrying fibers. So they figure out, they in gradually increase the intensity until it hurts with a certain kind of uh, stinging, and then they go to three times that amount. And then they do that to you one time per second for 20 minutes. So I've done this at uh, 200 times, and it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but they did it, and, uh, and, and they get this uh, in, uh, really notable habituation. The thing is, in the habituation literature, if you use a lower intensity, you heighten the ability to get habituation, which is exactly what we found. So when we did this, remarkably, we said, oh, we're going to do this at two times blink threshold. So that means we're nice, and we put people in our lab, and we would increase the intensity until we would just start getting blinking, OK? So this is a much lower intensity than what was done in the previous study. And we applied it for 20. We even did it at 30 minutes. It's uncomfortable at times, but it's perfectly tolerable. And uh, you get this habituation effect. Basically, you, you lose your blink reflex in a lot of patients. You don't get it. And if you all tap yourselves on the, on the forehead, and, and eventually you, you, you stop blinking. And that's what, what happened. So the trick is now, how do you tell the difference between habituation, which is your body getting used to it, which, by the way, is its own circuit, which we realize very soon, and, and what is the modulation of the blink reflex itself? And that was a challenge. And what we did. Okay, so this is just, a, we, have lots, we have lots and lots of these graphs. So basically, this is a good, a good example. This is from a classic text in blink reflex. You, you do blink reflexes at one hertz, and look, you get blink, 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 and then it's gone. And we got this in a lot of people. If it's gone, then we have nothing to measure. All right. So um, the first thing we realized is here is the circuit that we've been studying. This is what we want to modulate. We want to keep this circuit here isolated because that's what we want to see if we change this blink gain using whatever fancy neuromodulation thing we can dream up, that it calms down the symptoms. Okay. But what happens is we probably are invoking a secondary circuit that is dealing with habituation. And when we looked into that literature, there's very little on it. There's maybe one paper that has actually looked at habituation and blepharospasm, and does have the suggestion that habituation as its own circuit is uh, less effective than, than in people without blepharospasm. So we turned that into its own circuit to study. And so we started to do that. Of course, when you start to do something, you need um, control subjects. So that we went to our uh, normal subject pool, which is uh, UCLA college students. 
Now, we had a second reason to do this because we were going to um, recruit blood flow spasm patients and we needed a way to measure their blink reflexes. So when you look in the literature for habituation, there is this other phenomenon called dishabituation, which is pretty well established. And let me show you that. So what happens is, whatever you're measuring, um, say the blink reflex or um, your uh, you know, feeding your cat or you're touching the nose of the earthworm that you're studying. Um, the more times you touch it, the, 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 the withdrawal response or the blink gradually goes down. Well, it turns out that if you just wait, say, 24 hours, then, and you bring them back and you do the test again, well, it comes back. It doesn't, it's not this severe, but it comes back quite a bit. And then you can run your experiments again. But when the person is in your lab, what you can do is you can do something here called dishabituation, and you can reset the system. And so the question is, how do you reset the blink reflex? Well, there is almost nothing really to go by there. So we tried a number of things. We tried to, uh, we bought an air horn, and we would startle people. You know, the startle, ah, boom! Anyone startle? Okay. So if you startle, that's a brainstem reflex. It, it, it's a big shock to the brainstem circuitry, and um, it seemed to have some resetting effect. Uh, we tried a bunch of different things, and in the end, we did this forced activation uh, paradigm. And you can see what I'm doing here. Um, hmm. There's probably no sound, but what's going to happen is uh, we, we would do five minutes of forced eye closure voluntarily. Uh, I don't know if it's playing. Well, anyway, there I am all hooked up. And uh, I'm hooked up to the Blink machine here, and it's got a speaker, and you get audio feedback, and when you squeeze your eyes, you hear it, and uh, it disappeared. And so we would do 10 seconds of force squeezing and then relax for 10 seconds, and 10 seconds of force squeezing, and, and it took a lot out of the person. Then we would let them relax for 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds to recover, and then we uh, looked for some uh, recovery afterwards. Um, I'm not going to go too much further into it, but we do have a whole series of experiments that we have run, and we're still analyzing the data on the control subjects where we had people do this dishabituation procedure versus just wait the five minutes and not squeeze their eyes shut. Uh, in the meantime, because we wanted to move on to patients, is we went ahead and implemented that in our blepharospasm patients. Now, that brings a whole other wrinkle to this story. Um, but let me, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come back to that. All right. So the second thing, uh, after we tried the low-frequency stimulation inducing wonderful habituation, is the spike timing burst stimulation. Fortunately, um, uh, Mark Hallett's uh, postdoc, uh, Stephanie Zuner, went ahead and did that for us and basically showed that she had habituation and could not replicate the findings here. So number one, she didn't replicate the findings exactly of this uh, study. So we didn't end up uh, uh, doing it ourselves. And number two, if you look at her data, she showed a lot of habituation that was confounding her data set. So we actually have gotten, um, not, not this exact data set, but another data set that actually BE BRF helped uh, Mark Hallett collect at NIH for a genetic study, and we're looking at that for habituation effects. So we'll be uh, working on that. So then we went on to trigeminal nerve stimulation, which I don't have a lot of data on, but let me just tell you a little bit about what that is. So this is a third uh, method of modulating the blink reflex, and the, it has, ironically, the least amount known about what it does, and yet it has the most amount of clinical trial data on it, because uh, Chris DiGiorgio in our uh, neurology department has been testing it in treating epilepsy. So this is a TENS unit, and it's just a regular TENS unit that you can buy for uh, pain. Um, if you look at the labeling on this device, it says, do not place over your throat or face. Okay. But in any case, we're going to go ahead and put it on the trigeminal nerve. So um, if, you, if you do this, it's, it's best to do it um, in a lab that's supervising to, to, to account for it. But once you know how to do it, people actually take it home and put a new electrode on uh, every night. They wear it at night for 12 hours and take it off for 12 hours. We provide them rechargeable batteries and, and so on. So it turns out that this study uh, is now moved into a phase three study for epilepsy. 
And the people were so happy that intractable epilepsy, not well managed with uh, anti-seizure drugs, were uh, getting controlled by this non-invasive um, stimulation that uh, they were happier. And so then the psychiatrist got involved and started studying depression. And so now there is a study of this uh, device being used for epilepsy and depression. So um, there's a company formed by that. I have no stake in that company, but I am uh, talking with them about trying to figure out a way where we can start testing this on blepharospasm as part of their protocol. So um, the, the TENS units are applied daily over the trigeminal nerve over here. What, what's interesting about this is they do not have any um, what I consider basic science mechanism. They don't have a good rationale for why exactly it works. And so one of the things I wanted to do is uh, study the blink reflex because after all they're stimulating the trigeminal nerve and I think it'd be appropriate to study the uh, blink reflex while doing this. Uh, that hasn't gotten off the ground yet but something I'm interested in pursuing. What we did do was we recruited uh, three blepharospasm patients, uh, two cervical dystonia patients, one hemifacial spasm patient, and one patient with a, um, a, a rare dizziness disorder called mal de debarkment, which is a uh, form of dizziness that they get off the cruise ship. You know, if, when you're on a cruise ship, you feel dizzy, and then when you come off, you adapt to the ground. These people never unadapt and they feel chronically dizzy even though they're on solid ground. So it's another disorder where something gets stuck. And so we ran them, uh, at least the, the, the blepharospasm, hemifacial, and cervical dystonia patients through this protocol. So the tricky thing is our patients get botulinum toxin. And uh, one of our theories, which I'm not going to get into, is botulinum toxin actually has an effect on modulating the brain as well. And so how do you integrate that with uh, something that we're trying to do with the blink reflex? So we came up with this really complicated design. It's uh, a bit, uh, you know, people who stuck with our program really, really had a, a lot coming to them because, um, you know, coming to UCLA and parking in Westwood is really a pain if you come every month for six months. Uh, so people did that. And, and you get uh, electrically zapped. But, but, the, but, but you do get treatment uh, outside my clinic, so you, you don't have to wait in my waiting room as much. Uh, so you get uh, two, uh, my, 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 my highlighter is not working well. So you get two cycles. This is a, the, the top row is one three-month cycle, and the bottom row is one three-month cycle. And we would randomize one of the cycles to be a trigeminal nerve stimulator. And, oh yeah, I can use this one. Thank you. I would randomize one of the three-month cycle to get the trigeminal nerve stimulator and one three-month cycle to not have the trigeminal nerve stimulator. We're still uh, digging through the data. The issue is, again, um, a couple issues. The botulinum toxin injection itself affects the blink reflex. You, you, your, your muscles get weaker, and so does the blink reflex. So we're trying to get, figure out ways around that. Um, we talked a little about, about spread of toxin. I can tell you that our cervical dystonia patient, who was injected at visit one, at visit two, the blink reflex dived down to about 40% you know, of its former level even though we didn't inject anywhere near the eyelids. And so um, there are these spreading effects that are there. So we're going to be uh, analyzing this data for a little while yet and hopefully come up with something that we can pilot combining this uh, pretty novel stimulation for which there is some resources available uh, to, to test. All right. I'm going to conclude with the other end of this. This is not work in our lab, but we're following it very closely is uh, we were uh, uh, trying uh, to modulate the blink reflex here. Now the question is, can you modulate the brain up here? And uh, again, there's going to be lots of different ways to modulate the brain. Uh, but one thing I'm kind of pushing for, if you can't tell, is I'm interested in doing the studies in such a way that we'll eventually publish them, report them, and create some data to, to, to move forward with. So in this case, um, what we want to do is uh, modulate the brain in such a way that we measure the blink reflex. You know, after all, they're connected. So this is the other tool we use in the Brain Mapping Center. This is a transcranial magnetic stimulator. Um, there's a video here of me getting my brain stimulated uh, with a magnetic field. The magnetic fields don't care that your skull is in the way. Magnets go right through your um, skull pretty painlessly. It does make your scalp twitch. And when it stimulates my left brain here, you'll see my right hand twitch. So that's my left brain connected to my right hand. 
if you want to see this. Uh, well, I don't know. It's not working. Okay, so trust me. It twitches. And I don't look too distressed about it. All right, so that's important. Uh, let me move on. Okay, and then we can, of course, measure the, the twitch with the machine. Uh, this is from Mark Hallett's group, um, so at NIH. He's uh, done a pretty clever study. I didn't go into all the details, but a series of papers showing that the motor area uh, in the cingulate anterior area around here, this is actually a picture of a, another magnetic stimulator coil, about here, not on the side of the head like the diagram shows, controls the orbicular esoculi. Uh, it has not been replicated yet, so um, that's still a bit controversial, but it seems to be pretty good data. And then he does the same thing that I do. He looks at this and says, what can we do? And uh, this came out of that, um, that work in 2009. Uh, this is the try a lot of things on a very few patients kind of approach. Um, they had a few patients, seven of them, and they tried the repetitive uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation on the brain. They tried the theta burst stimulation of the brain. They tried the direct current stimulator battery thing on the brain. And for each of those, they tried it roughly on two or four locations. Some of these are so big that you kind of lump some of these locations together. These are all different areas of the brain. It's a little bit shotgun in its approach, but the general idea is this is kind of the future of where neuromodulation is going. I'd like to see a little more rationality to it, but it's, it's difficult to do. And this was, you know, quite a lot of work, and, and it's impressive they got it done. So, uh, this is um, the low frequency repetitive TMS over here. This is the theta burst. This is the direct current stimulation. And only one of them, which is the physician rating, not the patient rating and not the blink reflex, uh, showed a significant improvement uh, as a group. And then when you break that down, um, it looks like it's the anterior cingulate, which is exactly where he predicted the motor area would be, and not these other areas, the supplementary motor area, uh, premotor and motor cortex, it's not those areas, it's uh, the, the stimulation condition here. Again, only seven subjects and only the physician rating. But this is the kind of thing that uh, I hope to be doing in the blink reflex moving forward. Um, this is a pretty hot field. A lot of uh, um, people are doing different parts of this. We have fingers in some of these, not all. There's the magnetic stimulation. I showed you a picture of me um, getting, but not a video. Uh, there's a trigeminal nerve stimulation, which is pretty interesting and I think shows some promise, though, again, I have no data for it right now. Um, I do have some data for it. I just haven't uh, finished analyzing it. Um, the direct current stimulation. And then there's the other things. There's deep brain stimulation, which hasn't really been done for blepharospasm alone, but has been done in MAGE syndrome when it's refractory to um, uh, medication and toxin therapy, severe enough to be disabling and for whatever reason, uh, and, and because it's Mays syndrome, not amenable to those uh, focal uh, surgery ophthalmologic techniques. Uh, and so the deep brain stimulation is uh, FDA approved Parkinson's disease and on a, on, a, um, as, um, on a compassionate basis for dystonia and sometimes works. And we, we quote about 50% success rate, though it's probably higher than that. Uh, there's a vagal nerve stimulation used for epilepsy. And then there's these things uh, the, that we've talked about with the, uh, uh, other, other ways that we try to modulate the brain. And you'll see that I lump botulinum toxin down here as a neuromodulator. I think that it does have effects indirectly on the brain. And so that's uh, the, um, a, sur a quick survey of um, what we've been doing with uh, uh, the field of blepharospasm in our lab. Um, neuromodulation is uh, for disorders of plasticity, like dystonia is a pretty active field. I think the blink reflex, uh, since we've spent so much time invested in getting it right in our uh, lab, we hope, um, we think it's a promising target for neuromodulation, and I think it also provides a way of measuring brainstem excitability for future studies. Um, and then we learned a lot of things. Uh, you have to account for habituation in studies of plasticity. A habituation is also its own circuit that may be deserving of its own study in itself. Um, the optimal parameters for modulation are not known. For example, should we be stimulating people at 300% pain threshold? Well, it's not likely to catch on real fast if we do that. Um, I think the trigeminal nerve stimulation is a promising new system being used that we will continue to study. 
And uh, I didn't even go into it, but we have uh, some things planned to analyze the effects of botulinum toxin as well. So thanks for your attention, and thank you very much for getting me involved with your group.